But it is my really my privilege uh, tonight to introduce uh, Heath Bunting, uh, an artist uh, very well known in Europe and internationally, uh, someone I've known for like 20 years or so. Uh, so Heath will be uh, presenting his project, but uh, maybe I should point out that, except for being a biotech artist, the field that I'm kind of also interested in, uh, is uh, he, he was one of the first net artists. So if you ever see like an encyclopedia of net art, you'll see, I don't know, Vukcho, Sich, Alexei, Shulgin, Heath Bunting. Um, it shows. Well, we invented the term. Yes, yeah. that <laughs> I know, but some of them are more married to we it than, than others. We pre historicized ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's all right, so you're in all the history books now. Uh, but he has also done uh, all these um, networking projects. Uh, one of the more famous projects was the King Cross uh, phone in, yeah. uh, where uh, people, uh, Heath uh, gave instructions to people to phone in to public telephones, and then there were uh, doing that, so by this they were uh, kind of uh, creating these connections with people they, they never knew, knew. So in a way, it, it, it was uh, in the beginning of everything which we term as new media art, which kind of changed really uh, in, in the 90s, because the new media art in the 70s and 80s is quite different to the, to the new media art from the 90s till now. So, um, yeah, I'll, I think I'll let you right, thanks. say the rest. Thanks. Yeah. It's good to be back. I was here... Yeah. Ten years ago? Was it ten years ago? Uh, Fourteen, maybe. Fourteen, yeah. Twelve, fourteen. Okay. Um, anyway, I'll show two projects. Uh, maybe we'll diverge or maybe get bored after that. And uh, but I'll feel free to interrupt with uh, positive or negative comments. So, Mel and T spoke about um, internet art. Um, and it was clear that the internet was going to uh, become a major part of everybody's lives um, by 2000. Um, so there wasn't such a need for uh, kind of avant-garde um, provocative artists to be involved anymore um, because our kind of intention had been fulfilled that internet would be for everybody um, and still quite open instead of a kind of crypto-fascist VR corporate marketplace. Um, so for me it was time to get out of, out of net art. Um, other people involved wanted to become professors or whatever. But for me that was very interesting, personally. Plus I wouldn't get a job for very long. Um, so I needed, I needed a way out and um, Actually, Canada and Matt, I, I was at Banff for three years during this kind of transition phase when I was looking for a, a way to get off the kind of virtual treadmill and uh, back to reality. And biotech was a way, way, an experiment in that because that's basically uh, where code impacts on real life. Um, so I did, I did a few biotech experiments, but eventually I kind of fell back down to the earth and also managed to live. Uh, live again in one place after eight years of touring. Um, so, after a few years of being stationary and very physical, I um, started this project, which is an examination of crossing of borders without paperwork. And uh, as I was in Europe, living in Europe in, in the UK, I decided to choose the European Union as my kind of playground, especially since it was uh, founded on the principles of open movement and open borders. Um, but the reality of that openness was uh, very different, and I, I had experienced that, and also other artists that I'd been on tour with um, who had often been denied access uh, or or had been imprisoned in borders, border posts, put in cages and deported. Um, so I thought this would be a good, good area of examination. And the activist scene at the time was very engaged with migrant, uh, helping migrants into Europe. Um, and there was a lot, a lot of kind of mystique around borders, but there was no kind of concrete uh, research and, and documentation of, of the border crossings. 
So I started off.
longest possible route to Costa Rhine ever. <laughs> like one island, two islands, and then up here. Because we didn't didn't take a map. We didn't know what we were doing. But that was, that was quite a pleasant, pleasant trip. Um, then I was interested, got quite obsessed with the UK border. Um, I noticed that some of them are, uh, there's the green and the there's sort of land and the water, and then there are these sort of black crosses. Yeah, black okay, crosses. yeah, there we go, yeah, like we'll that one. Yeah, Parts that UK. <clears throat> so I was interested in, the news at the time was um, that there were many people trying to get into the UK um, from sub-Saharan Africa, they'd come or from uh, Afghanistan, a lot of the kind of war zones of the fringe of the empire at that point, uh, people trying to get to the core of the empire. Um, so people were accumulating around Calais, uh, especially um, Calais Sangat, where there was a refugee camp uh, by the Red Cross. Um, so I thought I'd uh, research this and maybe do an escape from the UK, because at the time as well, uh, I was starting to be, uh, suffer from political depression the political police. Um, so I wanted a way to get out of the UK. So I was hanging around the borders, the border between the UK and France. So the first trip, for instance, you can see the exterior fence of the Channel Tunnel. You see lots of activity breaking through. Um, even to get to that, you, you'd have to avoid the riot police and the mafia, um, strictly controlled areas. See, you've got razor wire, electric fences, CCTV. So, for a kind of hacker, someone came from like a bit of a hacker scene, this was a, a challenge. Um, this, uh, this is quite an impressive uh, fence for open Europe. You know, it's, it's, it's literally like two meters wide, barbed wire, three to four meters high. But I, I learned to cross these kinds of obstacles by, by changing my perception of them as well, not seeing them as, as obstacles anymore, but maybe play things. Um, but also from a, a mathematics point of view um, and systems, there's, uh, there's a theorem called Gödel, Gödel's incompleteness theorem that suggests that every, every, every formal system has a hole in it. So can anybody guess how I got through, get, got on the other side of that fence? Carpet? No, it's through a carpet. Yeah. It just ends, and you can walk around the end. <laughs> <laughs> so, for me, active research is really important because you can sit down and say, there's no way we're never going to get through that fence. You know, and a lot of activists and people like that would say that, why are you bothering doing this? Until you go there and experience it, and actually explore a bit, you would never have suspected that you could just walk around the end of that fence. Other people just cut through it. Um, this was the train I wanted to jump. I get on and come into the UK. So you can see you just climb on the side and then hide under a truck. I've only recently started jumping freight trains. Because uh, there's a really nice train that comes through my city. You can see here, even there. Uh, Tunnel, tunnels being done. I think they're more for shelter. I did get into a, a few odd, odd situations psychologically. Yeah, this. I found myself in this tunnel at, at probably about four in the morning by myself. And just had one of these what am I doing moments. And uh, I had to give myself a bit of a shake. Went out. This was to get under. To, this was not even near the fence, but to, you know you have to go through all these kind of tunnels and sneak around to get anywhere near the fence. But uh, that was one of my limit. I reached my limit in that tunnel. A little panic attack in there. But eventually, I managed to get to the train. So I wanted to be able to get on and off the train in each both countries, and so I needed to get to actually touch the train. This is the area that I got through to to actually get get to the train. 
No, basically, I never did the project other than that, the research, because while you're there, you realise that it's a very serious, people in a very serious situation. And uh, this, you know, making a joke about it and going the other way and being ironic, it's a bit disrespectful, so I didn't do that in the end. Anyway, while I was doing, doing that, having fun, risking my life, I realised it was a bit futile as well, because most of the controls now take place in the systems, the, the, especially even the border, so um, you can travel around Europe quite often, and it seems that there's no, no controls on the border, but you still end up getting arrested somewhere, like the London Underground. So the London Underground, for example, now, um, is one of the main border controls of the UK. So if you get stopped for having an invalid ticket or no ticket at all, the police can, can be called and then they can call the border police. And before you know it, um, you're scheduled for deportation. So again, another example is if you're crossing, for, say, from Austria to Germany on the train, there will be plain clothes police officers or border, border officers on the train, maybe even now some kind of big data filtering systems, RFID or mobile phone sensing um, devices, but the, the, the effect is the same. You get off at, say, Munich uh, main station and you'll be met by the police and arrested and uh, in immigration detention if you're not in order. So I decided to... Um, start to study these systems, these human management systems. And um, so typically, as Melody suggested, I, I come from a, a street scene. Um, I started on the street level looking at uh, human systems. So I started with Tesco. Anybody know Tesco? Yeah. Tesco were the first organisation to introduce a loyalty card, I think, into the UK successfully anyway. So this here is a database of what I at the time called statuses um, that you can acquire or can be attributed to you as a, as, as a person or a human being or as a corporation, if you have to be a corporation. And it's very, it, each structure or the structure for each record is very basic, it's inputs and there's outputs. So to be uh, a holder of a club card, Tesco club card, you would have to, all of these things here would have to be true or conform to this formula. So this, to be able to provide your title and your current name and provide your gender and provide your postal address, etc., etc., And eventually you would have a Tesco club card and with that, you would be able to prove, you could use it as proof of title, proof of name, um, and I can't see what the other ones are down there below. Um, but each one of these, this is a, what's known as a relative database. It only refers to other things in the database itself. And unlike most databases that have some kind of container that you put some data in, there's no container, no data, they're the same thing. So I'll, sh I'll, sh I'll show you that bit, bit later. But anyway, there's currently about 20,000 of these entries in, uh, in this database. So if you click on this one, able to provide um, current postal address, it will be a very precise definition of what a postal address is made up of. Um, and where else that postal address is used other portions of the system. The thing that troubled me was often from the anarchist circles, people say fuck the system, but there'd be no definition of the system. So this was an attempt to define the system precisely. So once you have all of this stuff, um, you can start to do visualization of this. So let's see. So 
this is an example of a visualization of um, the statuses that are relevant to the concept of homeless and homelessness. I worked for six months with people who could be classified in some way as homeless in Newcastle in England. Um, first thing I realized was that most of these people uh, were not interested in changing their social status. They were quite happy where they were, um, relative to being unha un more unhappy in maybe higher social statuses, but more stressful situations. They, they found a, an equilibrium. So I came along and said, well, did you know that if you did this and you did this, and it's only two steps, you could have this and this? And they were like, yes, I do, but I'm not interested. But the thing that interested the people the most was being able to see their position relative in uh, in, in the system. So this is a classic function of a map. The map isn't really to show you where to go, it's to show you where you are and what's around you. And with that perspective, you have a greater understanding of your own circumstances and possibilities for change. Another thing that... Um, interested the people I was working with was that there's equal, equally uh, a system for making you homeless as a system for leaving homeless, helping you leave homelessness behind. So there's the classic kind of uh, belief is that homeless, being homeless is all your fault and there are systems to help you to get out of that. But there's equally just as much system influence on making you homeless as there is on rescue, rescue from that. And for homeless people to uh, see that, uh, have that demonstrated to them, was they, they felt quite relieved about that. They were a lot of guilt was somehow lifted from their shoulders. Okay, there's one other thing. Actually, I've forgotten what the third thing was. <laughs> Oh yeah, third thing. Uh, as I mentioned, most of the people I worked with were not interested in changing their si situation at all, but there were a few people that were, and um, they, only one of them used this map because it resonated with this kind of uh, method of learning and, and, and conceptualizing his situation and systems. Um, other people were more interested in kind of storytelling and narratives like this. The one person took this map and within a couple of weeks got an apartment and a few weeks after that a bank account and a credit card. So after about a month he radically changed, radically changed his life. Um, so I was, quite, I was quite pleased with um, the, the effectiveness of the map, the map that we've made together, um, but I had been surprised about um, a lot of my assumptions had been overturned. I should add that the maps I'm showing you here are all, all automatically generated. They're not, they're not me sitting down uh, with uh, some ideas and trying to express them in design. Um, I'm le learning as much in the process as uh, any other potential viewer. So I'll show you another map that actually helped me a lot. I, I should add that I've, I've spent periods of time that could be classified as homeless as well. So the other map was did have some resonance with me, but this one, this one's had a lot, a lot more uh, emotional and psychological resonance, and also practical. So this this map here got me out of prison. So as I, as I mentioned earlier on, I was mid to mid mid noughties, like 2006 to 2008. I was being detained by the political police probably every two weeks and interrogated sometimes up to 24 hours. And there's quite a stressful situation because they cause you to not get to where you're going. Um, you have no right of silence, for example, as well. So that's, a, that's an incredibly stressful position to be interrogated for 24 hours without remaining silent. You have to don't, don't answer the questions in a meaningful way. You can automatically go to prison for three months. So um, that was my circumstance at the time. But then they decided to up the pressure on me a bit more. And they, they created a false case against me for planting a 
host bomb at Gatwick Airport. Uh, that, I, in retrospect, though, really, I think they were using me as a as a pawn in a in a game to discredit the climate climate camp uh, scene at the time. But I, did, I didn't know that at the time. I was just felt it was a personal persecution against me, and I was I was quite desperate to get out of the situation. I was facing up to seven to ten years in prison for, for this this false case. Anyway, so I thought I would try and turn the situation around. This has been one of my strategies in my life, is take something bad and turn it into something good. So I decided to kind of go on the offensive, have a positive attitude. Um, at the same time, there was a, a case, a false case against Chris Grant Ensemble in the United States, particularly against Steve Kurtz. Um, he'd been set up. And he struck his uh, way to try and deal with that is to appeal to the public and then raise money, uh, try and uh, change the law, get it out of that way. I decided, I, for me, I thought that wasn't going to work, certainly in the UK, so I decided to do a kind of back, a back deal with the cops um, and use kind of real, real political power instead of um, symbolic power in the media. So this map was part of the, part of the strategy. Um, so I studied all the law of, uh, concerning terrorism, and okay, so the map here is is how you become defined, classified as a terrorist. I was classified as a terrorist, and here are groups that are classified as terrorists. So this is kind of law, and this is its impact on on people or groups. Um, and what I wanted to do was return back to normality because being classified as a terrorist at the time I thought was a negative thing. The more recently I realised that it's actually it's not negative or positive. You can use use it um, in your favour if you use it in the right way. And what I wanted to do was return to normality. I see, and in the UK, probably as is in, as in Canada as well. Normality is defined as the high street, particularly consumerism, shopping. You work, you work to earn money, to spend that money at the weekend, on a particular on Saturday. So that's where I wanted to be back. I wanted to be back uh, where I grew up, in a nice, cosy, safe high street, um, being happy to buy a new shirt or, or something like that. And so what the, what's the routes, what the routes uh, to get there? Well, there's one over here, as you can see. As I said, this, these are all automatically drawn, these diagrams. So uh, I've discovered as much as anybody else from these. This route over here, anyone? This, one, this long, very singular route would be to return back to normality. A pardon or something? Oh, it looks like, like a pardon. Like you're just automatically ejected from the category. Yeah, it's going to prison. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you have no options. There's a, there's one little option out there, but you ba basically go back, come back that way, the long way back. But I was interested in the shortcuts and not going to, pr not going to prison. And so these these so this is the high street, this is terrorism, this area here, like the border zone, is what interests me. Anyone guess what that is? I won't zoom in so you can guess between terrorism. And consumerism. Uh, spend, like overspending, racking credit card debt. Uh. No, it's merchandise. So all of the terrorist groups that successfully produce merchandise, <laughs> like flags, caps, T-shirts, <laughs> yeah, going on speaking tours, had then be de being de declassified, not necessarily officially. But, for instance, like the IRA, yeah, or Sinn Féin, groups like that were no longer hunted down and murdered because they'd made steps to enter the marketplace. So that's what I needed to do. I realised from analysing this man that I needed to enter the, enter the art market with, with the product, and particularly this product. So I managed to gain a small commission from the Tate at the time, which was the, the main leading institution for the art market in the UK. Um, 
So I've got their kind of stamp of approval. They bought this project for five hundred pounds, which uh, is very handy for me. Not for necessarily for the money, but because uh, I needed the money because I had to travel a lot to be. You know, whenever you're arrested and go to court, I was on bail, so I had to go report to police station as well every two weeks at the other end of the UK. And, uh, it was early in the morning, so I had to either stay in hotels or travel early on train. So the five hundred pounds was useful for my defence fund. But the most important thing was the stamp of approval from the Tate. And so, on the last time that I was detained by the political police coming into the UK, I had nothing other than my passport on this map. Because you can't travel with anything, you can't have any other paperwork, any other objects, because they can be used to incriminate you. Even receipts for things you might bought, might bought a sandwich, police will photocopy all of those and try to potentially add them to a narrative about you, about something that you may have done with that sandwich. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, anyway, so if you imagine that I've been taken away, I'm in an interrogation room, the police sat me down, it's like, we want to ask you some questions. And I turn around and politely say, oh, I, I have some questions for you this time as well. They're like, well, no, we asked the questions. You know, we're, we're in charge here. It's like, no, no. Pull out this map, it's like a big A zero, and start to point you bits on it. So, got some questions about this area here, and they're like, they don't know what to do, you know. Start taking notes, <laughs> and then normally these 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 kind of interviews last for about two hours, two to four hours. But after about like, fifteen minutes, they said, okay, you can go now. It's too hard. You know? And then two weeks later, I got a phone call from. Hmm. An unknown police officer who said, uh, We're very pleased to inform you that you're no longer categorised as a terrorist. You're free to go. So, from this map. From being part of the market, you were legitimised. <laughs> well, and then they said, we were very interested in your map. Is it possible to have a copy? <laughs> <laughs> so I sent two signed copies to the arresting officers at the time, and they're on the police station wall. So okay, be careful now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think I succeeded in turning a bad situation around into a good one. Um, but I would prefer not to be. Well, I'd say that. But, you know, I, I learned a lot. Ask a question. Yeah, sure. In uh, in, in, you, do you, in your impression, do you think that they released you because you had created some sort of reflexive visibility on their system, or or did you somehow demonstrate to them a, a relationship to the system and then validated that you weren't actually terrorists? Um, it's hard to say because it's not a monolithic. You know, repressive apparatus. Right. Uh, even in the police station, every person has a different role. So, right. if you can find out what their role is, you can often turn them. You can find the the, for, for, the faults. That's the one word. Yeah. The kind of fissures between the different roles. So, like, if you were the arresting officer, it's your job to get me in the police station. Right. But if you're the detainment officer, it's your job to keep me alive. And if right. you think my life is in danger, you can you can release me. So right. you can get the two officers start debating about <laughs> whether I should be released or not. Right. Um, so, but that's just in the police station. Then you've got the whole court system, and you've got different polices, police right. departments. So it's more like an algorithm than a. I I would say I generalised by saying I was disruptive to what they wanted to achieve. Right. And there were people who were trying to help me. And there were people who were trying to set me up. Mm -hmm. It's a good project for the next I see <laughs> Disruption. Disruption. <yeah. laughs> but going through, going through such a process, you learn a lot about politics, how things how things work. Um, okay, so I carried on with the project anyway. It was interesting that the, the police 
were didn't appear to be against uh, this study of the system. Sometimes they made a few jokes jokes from me about having had the identities. But yeah, it definitely wasn't a problem. So I felt I was supported. Uh, so I carried on. And uh, some people let, let it be known to me that uh, what I was doing was not actually illegal. Because at the time I was trying to find ways through the system, the shortest routes. And um, I was kind of tipped off a, a bit. Um, I was told a few times that it's possible to make new identities um, lawfully, so you don't have to create like an algorithm that guides people through the system, um, finding the best kind of configuration. You can actually just have a, a whole new identity that's ideally configured for you. So I decided to test that out. and see if I would get into trouble. If we are all managed by the system, and we are conformist, and we do not rebel, then we automatically become the system, or certainly a portion of it, so, uh, sub-portion. So here you see a sub-portion of the system, um, the entire system, that you could be considered as an individual. These are visualizations of interviews of people around me at the time, um, visualized as systems diagrams, systems graphs. So what's important is not the, the points of description, but the linkage between them. And so you can see, by visualizing in this way, you, you, can, see, you can see the density in the areas and the, zone, the zones of people's identity. Now, if you ignore this one, I think, and this one, black and the colored, colored, colored ones. All of them except one are real people. One of them is synthetic, one's been made up. Can anyone guess which one is the so-called fake? What would a fake identity look like? Can I say the second? The that one there? Yeah, so far as that. Seems to have relative to the other ones far fewer. Yeah, it's less stuff. dense. Yeah. But this is in fact a missing artist of Bristol at the time yeah. from Turkey, Fatma. So she has less less uh, interaction with the UK system. Mm. The other one I would guess would be the denser one. This one, just as being exceptional. Yeah. Let's see what that one is. No, that was a direct to an arts organisation. Mm. <laughs> so obviously lots of responsibility, lots of legacy. <laughs> this is the synthetic one. So this one. So I set out to. Um, this was a prototype. Well, the proof of con yeah, proof this was the proof of concept. Can you make a new identity that's a subset subset of the system? Because nobody wants to be the entire system. It's just too, too burdensome and contradictory. Um, can you make a, a new identity that conforms directly to the system, therefore is totally within the law and undetectable? This one took, I think it was two years to make, and it was uh, totally over-engineered, like a Coke bottle. And there's all the definitions here, which are now greatly expanded as sort of gone further and further into opening up these definitions. After a while, I'd, once I'd proven that it was possible, I consulted with police and lawyers um, and shown that do this without breaking the law, and they confirmed that it was lawful. I decided to make some prototypes. Because this one here cost about 3,000 pounds to make. I wanted to get the, the cost down to about 500, which is a, an acceptable street price. Uh, and I managed to, I think it was about six months to do that. Eventually I got down to the stage where make a new identity using this flowchart. 
can anyone guess how long it takes to make a new identity with a debit card in the UK? Two weeks? Two days. Uh, I was in Spain the other last month because I've done workshops around Europe as well to kind of frame the project in the UK. We made a new Spanish national identity with a debit card in an afternoon using some of the chart. Yeah, and that's, that's something I'll be showing up at OCAD, actually. I brought with me as a boxed, boxed identity. Um, so people that use these could be people that have stalkers, people that are working on risky projects. For instance, I made two for an artist that was searching the political police in the UK, one for him and one for his girlfriend, so they can, they can travel together and be safe when they're working. The one that I bought with me to Canada that's going to be shown in Toronto is um, a way to get around the laws of the European Union that state that you can't profit from organ um, organ donation. Now, there's in the news today that uh, there's forced organ removal in Ukraine at the moment, and uh, just over the border from Macedonia in the 2099. Oh yeah, of course I'm there. Yeah, people were, that's where I was working at the time, <laughs> naively, uh, having their organs removed. Um, so there, there are good reasons to s stop the trade in organs. So organs can only be donated, your expenses can be paid, but you can't profit from them in any way from the transfer. So the, the box that I've got is a new identity um, that has received uh, don donor statements, pledges from people when they die, uh, which is lawful. Um, but you can package all of these uh, pledges up into one identity and then sell the identity because identities are property. Otherwise, you would have not have identity theft. Um, so that's what I'll be showing. Uh, okay, is this? Uh, what is kind of corporatization, it's kind of incorporation of uh, a difference of a subject, or different subjects into an object. So once this new identity is formed, it becomes a part of the system. It can yeah. hold, for example. Yeah, it can only exist by being part of the system. Yeah, but but it's a part of the, of the whole system in, in, in every single segment, right? Yeah, yeah. So it can be asked to be on juries, right? It yeah, can, yeah. Yeah, the police you know, can be drafted to be the instance. army. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, the head of the Metropolitan Police came out recently to defend one of their officers who created a new identity and gone to court after committing a crime. And the new identity was tried and found guilty. And the head of the Metropolitan Police said, there's no law to prevent this. It's not unlawful. It's a perfectly lawful thing to do. Anybody can do it. And of course, you know, the people in positions of power know this and have multiple identities. So so everyone should have one. Well, there's overheads so, though. You know, you know how much work it takes just to maintain your own identity. <laughs> yeah. All the nonsense you have to go through. So if you have two or three, you have two or three the amount of nonsense to go through. So you, you have to have a good reason to do it. But it's good for the economy as well, because population grows, right? <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> well, I have been All asked, the parameters are up. Yeah, I have been asked to work on a project, I think it's in Dresden, to multiply the number of people in the city. Oh yeah, because Germany yeah. is going down. Yeah, yeah. in Eastern Germany, yeah. But, uh, we'll see about that. Um, so, I worked on that for a few years. I'm still, I'm still running a new identity workshop, so if you, if you ever want one or want to attend, let me know. Um, but then I became interested in collectives, um, corporations. So you take a group, you take individuals and you uh, subjects, and you bring them together and you make them into an object as a corporation. Um, corporations tend to be well out of the reach of most people, but you can, in the UK, you can buy one for fifty pounds on the internet, and then you can have it forever. Um, so. Financially, it's not out, out of 
agree to anybody. Um, generally, if you have a corporation, you don't go to prison and you don't pay tax. So it's a good, good criminal reasons for having them. But then I start to notice um, that there's a, there is a type of corporation that's undeclared. So if I, if I go online and pay my credit card uh, for a corporation or register, or register one, uh, my, my natural person, Heath Bunting, will be registered. Um, that means that anything that the corporation does can be traced back to Heath Bunting. And the other things that are registered under Heath Bunting become vulnerable, like my bank account and my ability to vote, etc., etc. But uh, if you watch the news, you'll see that there's these kind of strange effects that happen, and they're, they're not attributed to anybody. It's a bit like the weather. Um, so you'll have these things that seem to go wrong in the world, and they could be, oh, that's just an effect of the system. You know, we all know the system is irrational and it's uh, paradoxical. But if you if you look a bit longer and deeper, you see that actually there is there are elements in the system that make these effects happen. So, for instance, like the Iraq invasion, you know, it's it's been a mystery to most people, even though they have a suspicion that it's all about oil. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and there are lots of events like this in the world, especially now, um, because of the great crisis. So you see somewhere, something like Ukraine. It doesn't, doesn't seem to make sense. Um, and I, my proposition is that there's uh, intermediate layers of anonymous corporations in, in action. Some people call it dark state. In media, it's the dark net. But basically, they're, they're organizations that <coughs> either are nameless and or have nameless participants. So a drug gang would be a classic example of that. The, the, the gang would have a name, but the participants would be nameless. They wouldn't say, I'm Heath Martin, I'm the director of the Crips, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, <clears throat> these exist. They're very powerful entities. Why not codify them and make them available to the general public? So that's what I'm in the process of doing. <laughs> um, specifically, let's see if I can find on the map, for households. You know, there's a lot of scandal at the moment about people being under constant surveillance. Especially law-abiding people. Um, okay, this, this one. So this is a flowchart of how to live in your home anonymously. <coughs> so you what you basically do is you turn your household into a corporation, an anonymous one. So all of the bills, all the relationships with the governments or official bodies are with the housing, housing corporation. And the people that live in the house are completely invisible to systems of surveillance and control. And as you can see, it's quite an easy, easy easy process, um, you can do it in an afternoon and it will mean that even though your telephone will be bugged, well everybody's telephone is bugged, uh, even though the telephone is bugged and may be analysed by humans, even though they've got internet traffic is bugged and may be analysed by humans as well, um, they won't know directly um, who lives in the house. So this is this is very useful for anybody that's involved in any cultural or political activities because all of us are under constant surveillance from machines. But if you uh, if you're a cultural worker, you will be under exceptional surveillance. And I'll give you a, I'll finish off now. But I'll give you an example of how I know that. Um, I've worked for various organisations and been at very different conferences. I was at a conference at a Ministry of Defence in Whitehall in the government department a few weeks ago and it's uh, 
the event was how can we make the general public more accepting of identity management technologies. Basically, how can we persuade people that being controlled and monitored is better for them? And uh, because I'm an expert, maybe from the other side on identity, I was invited. But at the end, one of the organisers stood up and said that uh, he, he said what his work was that he was a psychologist for the Ministry of Defence, and they profile resistance individuals and groups around the world to uh, defeat them, you know, for assassination or whatever. And they had realised in their research that the most effective resistance strategies come from artists and that they wanted to work with artists in future in the UK to develop resistance strategies that then they can uh, look out for around the rest of the world. This, is, this isn't some online conspiracy website, this is a person who's head of department psychological analysis of resistance around the world for the Ministry of Defence from his home mouth artists develop the most effective resistance strategies to repression. So if you, if you are involved in culture in any way, in any kind of resistance to any kind of repression, I'd suggest that you consider turning your house into an anonymous corporation as one step um, to protect yourself and your activities. This is a new area of research for me. I've only been working on this about six months. And I will continue to uh, tour this as workshops around, certainly Europe, um, to, uh, to refine the process and to get access to such statements from people that we, we may consider to be our adversaries as workers for humanity. Anyway, um, should we leave that there? to a quick question <laughs> and answer session and then we can wrap up. Anybody got anything to say? Or? I was wondering, I guess, how much, uh, <clears throat> or if you know how much it changed, I, obviously this, all of these diagrams have probably changed from country to country based on laws and blah, 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 but is it, do, you know, do you know if like Canada is somewhat similar to the UK just in a lot of ways because of, you know, connection? Yeah, yeah, it's very similar. Most of the things that I've spoken about here today will be almost identical. So the examples, for instance, that if you look closely at the blue diagram, it will have examples of electricity companies that will deal with anonymous anonymous corporations, yeah. but they won't be in this country. Yeah. Um, so the very precise examples won't be relevant here. But the fact that they are examples of organisations that will deal with anonymous corporations in the UK and Canada is based on the same legal system as the United States and the UK and Australia um, and a lot of the European legal models as well, legal systems, then I'd say, yeah, almost certainly you can set up these, these entities here and have them recognised and be effective. I am, oh, sorry, Jim. Jim. Well, uh, I'm actually a little curious. In Canada, uh, many artists are funded by the government mm. for their projects. And I'm just wondering about your funding and if you get government funding and how that affects you, I guess, in general, fairly simply. Uh, generally, I don't get funding directly. Mm. Um, for instance, last year there was a lot of suspicion that I was actually on a, a blacklist because all of my work stopped. Um, it turns out that I'm probably not on a blacklist, um, but blacklists do exist in the UK, even for just people who are like builders, for instance. It's been shown that um, if you complain about any health and safety issues, you will be put on a, a blacklist that's maintained by an agency, and the building building corporations <coughs> will consult that that blacklist. So if you come on, say. You know, I want, I want to work on your building site. They'd be like, oh no, you can't work here. The big scandal recent that's been found out though is that the information that goes onto that database has been provided by the police. So oh. there are blacklists for just normal workers who have expressed any concern about health and safety. They don't have to be communists or anything like that. So I would say with that, with that in mind, it's almost certain that there will be 
a blacklist for artists, cultural workers, and human rights workers, lawyers, etc., etc. So, um, yeah, I have I have noticed some, you know, uh, strange effects around me, um, but I get around that by being independent, by coming to things like this. Mm -hmm. I know Melody, I know a bit about this organisation. Uh, it's very straightforward. I can't to talk, hang out with you guys, and go away again. Um, but if we were talking about tens of thousands of pounds for a project over six months or something, then I'd be I'd be dependent, and then I could be persuaded otherwise to do things <laughs> in another way. So I I try to avoid uh, government funding. It's also um, well, this is one thing I've worked from working in like war zones as well. The the personal is the political, so. It's, it's not necessarily, you don't have to look for the big political reason or for the big political sign. So, for instance, if you're uh, a Muslim woman walking down the street, a Serbian woman walking down the street in Kosovo at three in the morning, you'll probably get sexually assaulted and no one's going to help you. Um, but that's part of a large pattern of ethnic kind of brutality. Um, that from the West point of view or the BBC point of view is ethnic conflict but from your point of view it's just random street violence mm -hmm. so whether you're talking about the overall kind of big P of funding or blacklists the day to day small P is that you'll either be disadvantaged or made uncomfortable or made to look insane if you engage in those kind of systems mm -hmm. for me personally for the work that I do yeah, I just maybe the the context is is not completely understood. Uh, at a conference in Australia, I understood this. Uh, Australia is maybe more indicative than, than than Canada because Australia was proclaimed terra nullius. Yeah, it, it was proclaimed that there are no indigenous people in, in Australia. So then they the rational and and it, and it happened uh, in the at the at the height of the rationalistic experiment in Europe. So basically, the the uh, rationalistic mesh was put on on the on the continent, and everyone had to comply with with the orders and and and, and rules. Um, in Europe, it's a bit different because outside of government, you have a lot of, uh, you know, you have the Paris Commune. You have a lot of kind of religious different sort of communities. Uh, you you can get funding from the European Union or another country. Uh, there are a lot of uh, sort of uh, private groups with with their own agendas, etc., etc. There is the network of communities. So so in a way, it's not it's not almost impossible to to set this uh, sort of rationalistic net as it is here. Like here in, Ca in Canada, it's all about. Uh, positivism and political correctness. Mm. Almost like a project like this would be almost inconceivable. Like mm. the need for it would be mm. inconceivable because society has been already in instrumentalized. Mm. It's like the biopolitical apparatus has mm. been set, and that's it. There, there's no way where to go. Like you, you wouldn't even think mm. uh, to 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 change your own situation. Whereas, um, whereas in Europe, it's still like a boiling, uh, you know, pot. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so and it goes. Also, it yeah. varies from country to country. Yeah. So, for instance, because I've done this. For instance, new identity workshop in almost all of the countries in the European Union, you, you really see the differences. So, for instance, I was in Spain the other day, in crisis, you would have thought people would have been a bit confused, or um, but they managed to achieve consensus in terms of law, uh, philosophy, and actual functionality to make a new identity in an afternoon. Whereas I, I attempted that in Greece a year before, and same similar kind of crisis, maybe a little bit more severe, couldn't achieve anything. Mm. You know, because they, people in the workshop say, oh, we don't need your workshop. We, you know, yeah. we hack the system every day. Yeah? We, we know, you know, what can you teach us? And I say, okay, then, show me. Let's go and do it. How do we get a debit card? And they're like, oh, it's impossible. <laughs> so it's like this total double, double contradictory thing. Um, so from country to country, uh, around the European Union, you know, there's 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 a there's a lot of difference. So some small countries, like Netherlands, totally like you say, totally bolted down. You can't get a a mobile phone. Mm. You know, a, a lot of times when I'm there, I can't even buy a train ticket because I'm not I'm not a, a Dutch national. You can't buy a train ticket because they're their own stupid little you know 
debit card system. <laughs> you can't pay with cash, you can't pay with Visa, stuff like that. Other small countries like Switzerland are very malleable. You know. um, but you, it's interesting you talked about, um, somebody just mentioned about, we couldn't imagine. Because, so for me, this, this project is a trilogy. So the first part was how to change your, change your physical location by, by crossing borders. The second part was how to change your social location. And now, um, the way I'm viewing it now is how to change, how to change your mind. Because you know, if there's only one line, there's only one route for you, it's, you cannot imagine another way to do it. But if you've got a very complex network of interrelations inter between concepts, then uh, you can easily imagine and articulate other possibilities. Um, and for me, this is where the project starts to get very interesting because I've had to develop a consistent language to describe power. So across the whole kind of spectrum of existence. So whether you're in the forest, where we, where we may be tomorrow together, or whether you're in the boardroom of corporation, I can describe e those situations equally and effectively, and I can make the linkage between them. And, you know, typically scientists, even chemists, can't talk to physicists. Um, but I found a way now for trees to talk to you know, corporate leaders. <laughs> and Malenti's right about the, you know, there's lots more cracks, or there's certainly lots of cracks if you're prepared to, if you're prepared to speak, to learn this language and speak it, to, to become a corporation or become a multiple person, multiple nationalities and identities, then the doors are open to you. So, for instance, I was consultant for the European Commission on identity. You know, all of the other participants were like the head of national security for, you know, the Netherlands or something, and there's Heath Bunting, like, from a rational anarchist group, you know. <laughs> but because I was prepared to engage in that situation and argue in their language, I've made them adopt now a, a precise definition of identity now that enables you to have multiple identities. So any bureaucratic system in the U United, European Union now will accept that you can have multiple identities. <coughs> In future, all future implementations of group administration systems have that hard coded into them. Do you think you'll be doing the border crossings project uh, on the border of England and Scotland in September? <laughs> well, these, these debates are very interesting, especially. Um, okay, um, can anybody suggest the, what is the largest and most dangerous anonymous corporation in the world. They're anonymous, so... <laughs> well, I would call it the, the United States of America empire. Yeah. Now, we're seeing the collapse of, of that empire. Um, so, normally, there would be kind of protected nations, participating nations, but as this collapse is taking place, um, these nations are being broken up. So, for instance, in, within the context of a, a corporation that's not anonymous, such as the European Union, with, which is, is named and we know it's participating members, Scotland would be very safe within the European Union. It'd break away and it could have the euro and it could have regulation and would be predated by large corporations. Um, but we're seeing as, as the empire collapses, it's becoming more kind of ruthless and bare knuckled. Um, you're seeing the intentional breakup of all sorts of countries now to, into smaller components uh, because that makes them more vulnerable. So we see the breakup of Iraq at the moment, broken up into three new nations, or maybe not so new, but um, reverting back to previous nations. And Syria and all of these kind of countries on the periphery of the empire as it collapses have been broken up into smaller pieces. So, you know, in the UK we have the UK Independence Party that says, let's leave the European Union. <laughs> you know, the European Union has protected the, the common citizens of the UK from the, the vast majority of the predatory kind of actions of the international corporate class. Um, what we should really do is, is become independent from the United States of America empire. Uh, but that's, uh, and it's 
That's potentially possible now. If you'd mentioned that a few years ago, people would think you're insane for even to mention those words. And, uh, and so many people were benefiting from that partnership that you would uh, you'd be threatening their livelihoods and existence. But now people's you know survival is is threatened anyway. So they're more open to these kind of crazy political ideas like disengaging from the United States. Are there any more questions? If there are not, then thank you very much. I we'll look forward to tomorrow's workshop. Uh, it was really an eye-opener, and you know, I enjoyed it. I'm sure everyone did. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll do another project here soon. Cool.